recap what we talked about last last week. So I, instead of me recapping, hopefully, I want to see what y'all remember. Uh, what what do you remember of last week's uh, topic? To recap. Okay. The, I came in late. So you I came in late, so you wouldn't. The you were. passing down of the sonship and about how it's not a genealogical like father to firstborn lineage. It's it's kind of God God's selection of people throughout time to carry on. The Excellent. Sonship. Excellent. So from Adam, Adam and Eve, and then we go to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. The, the, and then God chose the nation of Israel to be the sons of God, as, as Scripture records. And then we go to David, and David was a man of blood, and he wanted to build a temple, like you brought out last week, Ben. And uh, because uh, he wasn't a man of peace, God chose Solomon to, do, to take off where he left off. And then Hosea, Hosea uh, goes on and says... Right at the end of the Old Testament, he says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, talking about Israel, they transgressed the covenant, and there they dealt faithlessly with me. So God has always been seeking, uh, looking for somebody to represent him. All through the ages, that has not taken place up until the time of Jesus. And Jesus was the perfect Son of God, carrying on that corporate or that covenant position, that role, if you will, Jesus became the Son of God when? Uh, at the baptism, we see that uh, this, is, this is my beloved Son. And, and so at his baptism, he was recognized as, as the Son of God to carry on the role of what all of the others had failed to do and to bring in uh, this, uh, to uh, show what God's, plan was for mankind and and so we'll be speaking more today on that covenant identity and so we can understand the covenant a little more uh, first of all God reveals his heart for Israel and all of humanity in covenant terms okay and <clears throat> this covenant of steadfast love that we just talked about out of Hosea 6 6 and 7 entails Adam and the entire state of humanity as a whole. And it reaches back to God's original purpose for humanity and reaches forward to God's ultimate desire for the world. God's ultimate desire is what for mankind again? Uh, everlasting life. Everlasting life and to... Worship and repopulate heaven. Exactly, and how do we do that? What's the, what's the first uh, angel's message in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6? What's the first words? Fear God. Fear God, Fear God and do what? Give glory to him. Glory give to glory to him. So if we don't understand how to fear God and give glory to him, can we give the rest of the three angels' message? Good morning, Nikki. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Can we understand the rest of the three angels' message if we uh, if we don't understand that? How to fear God, how to give glory to Him, yeah. and that's what this covenant relationship is all about. And so that we can continue on the tradition of what Jesus uh, Himself lived out for us, so that we could carry it on. In Isaiah fifty-five three, it says that I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love that was promised to David. So that's for the church today. And um, here again, we see that the covenant is a relational dynamic that involves steadfast love, unfailing love, and faithful love. Okay, So covenant involves living with an unbreakable relational integrity. That's something that uh, though the heavens fall, uh, nobody will be able to separate us from that love. Uh, because we are living out that life that God has called us to live. So covenant is a biblical word that communicates God's core identity, God's character. Um, yeah, that fly goal. Uh, just a uh, uh, servant of Satan, right? I just tried to <laughs> distract that. <No. laughs> um, so, this, so the covenant reveals God's core identity, his essential character, right? 
I'm going to catch them soon. There we go. Oh, good job. There. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, by logic. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is all that God desires of us, isn't it? Steadfast love or covenantal faithfulness. That's all he's looking for in his people is for us to reflect his image to mankind. And by logical contrast, covenant breaking defies what it looks like when humans are out of sync with their true identity. And watch how Isaiah says it in Isaiah 24, verse 5 and 6. Uh, this is really, this is really deep right here. He says that the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken, guess what? The everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. So what does it say about those who break the everlasting covenant and his laws and who live outside of this covenant relationship? Cursed. cursed. Mankind is cursed because why? Because they have rejected. They have rejected the law. So to live covenantally is to live for all others in faithful love. <laughs> all you need is love, right? In, in God's terms. <laughs> <clears throat> So covenant breaking occurs when individuals live for self to the hurt of others. So when people go around being selfish and thinking of other, thinking of themselves, they're breaking that law. And as a result, the, cur the curse is upon them and upon the earth. So everything is affected from what we do. And uh, the very ecosystem, we're told, has been defiled. Everything. Everything of global warming. Yeah, everything has been defiled as a result of man's of man's. We're going uh, green now. We're going to break that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it's been defiled and devoured by our violation of the Earth's covenant system. So. Man has one solution, God has a different solution, okay? Mm -hmm. So in short, everything wrong with our world is a result of what? Sin. A broken covenant, a sin. First John 3, 4, sin is what? The transgression of the law, transgression of God's covenant, mm -hmm. right? Relationship. Or broken relationship or violated love. So all God wants for the world <clears throat> is for covenant faithfulness to be restored as our fundamental mode of existing. Now, if man works, if man works at outward reformations to get rid of evil and crime, is it going to work? If they work at outward reformations? Why is that? It's because it's not done in the heart. Ah, there it is. So man's fundamental problem is where? It's in his heart. It's, it's of the heart, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, like, uh, you know, it's like me walking down the street and seeing all these obese people and saying, you know, I'm tired of this. And being a legislator, I'm going to enact that uh, we take away all forks. We legislate forks uh, so that people won't get obese anymore. Is that going to work? No. <laughs> Why? Yeah, people are good at it. <laughs> uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll take that away. We'll take that away. Yeah. You know, so, so what mankind has done is the more laws we see, the more codes, the more enactments, the more we see that mankind is sinning. And so they continue to try to stop sin, but sin is of the heart. It's not going to stop yeah. unless, there's a, unless there's a change. Jesus, when he walked this earth, did he try to change everything outwardly? Did no. he try to change it? What did he do? He tried to change them by the, heart, the hearts. Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's the that's the key. Yeah, he didn't go to Caesar preaching to Caesar. He yeah. should change his ordinances and what huh. he puts on his people. Exactly. Do we have an Probably envelope? We could have. Uh, <laughs> for... <laughs> okay. Well, when that comes, that's... <clears throat> through Isaiah, God said about the coming Messiah. Quote forty-two, verse six. Quote: I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Who is this talking about? 
That's Jesus. Oh. Us too, because you know, it's it. We are, we are a continuation of Jesus' life of what He did. Daniel came along and foretold that the coming Messiah would do what? Confirm the covenant. <laughs> Confirm the covenant and be named the Prince of the Covenant. He said that about Jesus. We read that in Daniel 9, 27 and 11, 22. And so finally, Malachi closed the Old Testament by calling the coming Messiah the messenger of the covenant. And that's in Malachi 3, 1. So, in these texts, we read that the Messiah is God's covenant to the people in personified form. Number two is that God's steadfast love is moving in all relational directions everywhere. And that's why he is called the Son of God. So that he, in turn, can fulfill God's plan, what all the other sons of God failed to do. And God's covenantal faithfulness to the human race is confirmed. So Jesus envisioned the final form of humanity in precisely these terms right here. In John 17, 26, what did he pray? He prayed that the love with which you, talking to the Father, love me, the Son, may be in them and I in them. This is God's ultimate purpose for mankind, is for us to fulfill that sonship role that is passed on to every one of us as a result of being connected with who? Christ. God, yes. God's desire is that humanity would be reincorporated in, into the very love that flows freely between the Father and his only faithful covenant son, Jesus Christ. So in other words, when you read, when you read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament, you can see parallels all the time. For example, remember what happened in uh, Egypt when uh, Joseph had dreams? Where was he sent after that? He was sent into Egypt, wasn't he, as a slave? To preserve his family. That, that was God's ultimate purpose, was for Joseph to go into Egypt so that he could eventually save his family, save Israel, save the covenant people of God, save the Son of God, which was Israel as a, as a nation. Okay, that, that was God's plan to escape certain death. Genesis 42 and 45 and verse 5. And in the New Testament, we see where it parallels that another Joseph had dreams. Remember that? And then where did he flee with his family? Egypt. Into Egypt. To do what? To preserve his family. To preserve his family, right? And, and to... Uh, and so now Israel is reborn in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Read that in Matthew 2, verses 13 to 15. So when Israel came out of Egypt, what happened? God called the nation, what? In Exodus 4 and verse 22. He called Israel my son. When Jesus came out of Egypt, God said, out of Egypt have I called my son. Matthew 2, 15. <laughs> forging an intentional parallel between these two stories. And now, and what it's pointing out here is that Jesus is God's new Israelite son in this covenant relationship. See? Catching a parallel? Thank you. Didn't need it all? Don't, don't get a sugar high now. <laughs> so, we see many such parallels in the, in the Old and New Testaments. When we look at another one, it's, uh, if we look at uh, ancient Israel, which was, again, is God's corporate son, he was composed of how many sons of Israel? How many sons did Israel have, Jacob? Twelve. Twelve, Twelve right? Okay. Genesis 35, 22 to 26. So Jesus deliberately followed this pattern by calling how many apostles? Twelve. <laughs> yeah, true, true. The, 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 son, the other disciples chose that one. Yeah, but he, he allowed but he accepted it. it. He accepted it, and therefore he chose it. But then later on, of course, he rejected it, so he called. Who did he call in place of uh, 
Do we do we have a? There we go. Who did he call in the, in the place of uh, Judas? Who who took his place? There was a second Judas. Yeah, there was one. Well, yeah, but there was oh. a coin later on. Him, later on, he had to replace him. Paul. Paul came in. Is Paul and anyone else? Well, he wasn't one of the twelve. No, no, he wasn't one of the twelve. But God, but God, uh, he had twelve disciples. So he accepted yeah. Judas with the with the intention that with the hopes that he would uh, repent and turn his life over to him. And we can see uh, we can see these parallels in Matthew 10, 1 to 4, you know, where Jesus continued the continuation of Israel and he left off where Israel failed. So Matthew 10, 1 to 4, Galatians 3, 29, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. So everything that God promised to the world through Israel, God's unfaithful son was now brought to pass in God's faithful son, Jesus Christ. Morning, Eric. Hello. Hey. The story of Jesus is a microcosm of Israel's history. It's just a miniature form of what Israel went through. Okay, Only this time the story has God's unfailing love. He never failed in his, in his covenant relationship with God, did he? So this then is the sense in which Jesus is called the Son of God. Okay, Need more proof? <laughs> <laughs> Look at the Gospel of Matthew. When you look at all the different Gospels, how much time we got? Continue on all day if we want, but we won't. We look at the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew continued. Um, first thing that we're told in Matthew chapter one is that Jesus is none other than the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. And this is continuing where the Old Testament left off. So the Gospels just—it's just—it's just like okay. We're finished Malachi, now let's go into Matthew, you know, a few hundred years later. So it just continues off, and we see that in the story of, of the Gospels. And Matthew, uh, part of the story is built on the names of two key figures here. Abraham, which means what? Anyone know? Anybody know what Abraham means? He is the father of? All nations. Father of faith. Many nations. Father of All of them. Yeah, all of them, yeah. Father of faith, father of many, father of... Uh, and David means what? Beloved. Okay, so Jesus, we are told, is the son of David, the son of Abraham. So he is the father of many, of the beloved. So the Messiah who has now come in their lineage is what? Is God's beloved son. That's what, that's what Matthew starts his gospel up with in Matthew chapter 1. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So he is here in our world to convey God's love to the world and thus become the father of many. Let's continue where Israel left off. Abraham was the father of many as the sands of the seashore. You know, was Abraham, when God told Abraham that, was he only talking about literal, uh, Abraham's literal seed? No. no. What does the New Testament say about Abraham or about God's seed? If ye are Christ's, ye are what? Ye are Abraham's seed. Yeah. So, so it's a continuation. <clears throat> Listen, to, and so in, here where it talks about God's beloved son, he's here in our world to convey God's love to the world and thus become the father of many more beloved sons of God. So it was God's purpose and it's God's ideal to trans to spread this love to mankind. And what happens when this love is spread to mankind? Second Peter 3, 11 and 12, it says that, um, how's that go again? It says that, therefore, what manner of lives ought ye to live? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and hasten its return. 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12. God's, per, God's only purpose in this world is for us to have that holy character that he came to show us what it was in the form of the Son of God. And therefore, we can transfer that to others by living that holy and godly life. And, and my favorite author, Christ Object, that's 69, says that when this character, 
when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced, that God has been waited for, waiting for from the time of Adam, when this is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he can come and claim them as his own, going along with 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12. That's all God wants for us. And um, in Matthew, it says that Jesus, uh, his name will be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. So is Jesus God or is Jesus somebody that God created uh, somewhere back in ethereal? That's a nice big theological word. Uh, in eons past? Or was he the son of God that represented uh, God's son as in like Adam and all of the others represented? That he came to represent, he came to live out this covenant purpose that God called for us. But it was literally God who came down in human flesh. And he became our next of kin. He became to buy our, us back. Exactly. And so, if if Jesus was a created being, he would not be equal with the law of God because the law is forever. The, there was no there was no creation of the law of God. There's no scriptural recording of that, that this, the, the law of God represents his character. And if, if it was anybody less than God who came and died for the sins of mankind because they violated this law, then it, it then uh, still been lost. We, we still would be lost. So God, God didn't create Jesus some, in some time in the past so that uh, as a cop-out, I would say, as a cop-out and say, I'm not brave enough to die, so I'm going to create Jesus so that in the future you can die for the sins of mankind. It wasn't like that at all. It was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. So if you look at uh, what the angel did, the uh, <clears throat> angel told his parents to name him Jesus, which is what in Hebrew? What is Jesus in Hebrew? Anyone know? Who led the children out of Israel or into Israel or into Canaan, into the promised land? Who led them? Another parallel. He, so the angel told Mary his name should be called Jesus. Joshua. After the successor of Moses who led Israel into the promised land and they failed. They failed, so now it's Jesus. Now, Jesus has been called to live out that life that Israel failed to do. See how Matthew makes one connection after another between Jesus and the Old Testament story? Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, first of all, the city of David. And why was that? <laughs> because he is the son of David. Right? Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 2, verses 13 to 15 says, Out of Egypt... I have called my son. And remember last week, out of Egypt, that's when that's when Israel was called to be, you are my only begotten son, after Moses took them out of Egypt, and he called them his son. You are my son. Israel, you are my son. And Jesus, the same thing. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. So see the parallels here? Jesus the son was called out of Egypt just as God called Israel, God's corporate son out of Egypt, right? So this is why God spoke from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3, 17. I don't know how many of you have, uh, I've been in the church about 38 years. I've seen a lot take place where people try to make Jesus less than God because of these statements. I don't know if anybody has experienced that, but even in our own beloved church, I've seen where uh, people have tried to change and say, well, Jesus was, is God's genealogical son. It's, it's not scriptural, as we've seen last week and this week. It's, it's not scriptural. It's not in the Bible. This is what the son of God is, is what we, we've been discussing thus far. So when people try to make Jesus less than God they're taking away the foundation the foundational 
uh, scriptural uh, principles of salvation. That's, I've only had a wife of my uncle, who's a Jehovah's Witness, tell me that Jesus was created. Yeah. And they, they go so far as to change, uh, change John chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, they changed in their Bible to say, and the Word was a God. Because in that scripture, in the Greek, it's clear that Jesus is God. But they say, no, 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 he's the Son of God. And so they have to purposefully change that. There's no other way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and he became flesh. So God became flesh for us. And that's the only way for us to be uh, truly saved. Um, <clears throat> having come out of Egypt, first of all, is there any thoughts uh, before I go on? Any, any, any confused thoughts? Any, any? I know it's deep. It took me a long time to understand this. So to go through it in two Sabbath uh, lessons is pretty difficult. But if there's any, any confusion on anything, please feel free to ask. So having come out of Egypt, Jesus went into the wilderness, right, to be tempted by the devil, right? Forty days and forty nights. What does that remind you of? Moses. Uh -huh. And what happened with uh, with the, the Israelites? Flood. Huh? The flood. Uh, what happened with Israel? Were they in the Were they in the wilderness? Yeah. Forty years. Forty years. As who? As God's son. Okay. The Son of God, Israel, was in the wilderness 40 years. God purposed for them uh, to change their heart, to change their life, so that they could be brought into the promised land. Did they, did they succeed? There's like well over 2 million, uh, 2 million Israelites. Did they succeed in fulfilling God's covenant plan at the end of 40 years? Not really. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. That's not that's not a that's not a big deal. Uh, couldn't unite them ever. They could they could never be united. So now Jesus is going where Israel left off. So going into the wilderness for forty days to be tempted by the devil. Matthew four verses one and two. So Satan's attack on Jesus was aimed at questioning his sonship identity. Okay, just like Israel was. He said if Israel failed in the wilderness. We're going to get Jesus to fail. This, this is easy, Satan said. This was his grand test right here. This and also in uh, Gethsemane. You know. But this was, if Jesus failed in the wilderness during these 40 days and 40 nights, what would have happened? It would have been the end of everything. Would have been the end of, we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't we be around to be old. discussing this, would we? So it was crucial that Jesus uh, live out uh, live out this godly life and this covenant uh, fulfilling of this covenant purpose that uh, God had for him and what did uh, what did so Satan attacked Jesus and what did he do what was the first test that uh, that he uh, said to Jesus no it was appetite. You? well it was it was over appetite for sure and that's but where Adam but, but what it's but what did sat, Satan say to him yeah. If you're really the yes. son of God. If you are the son of God, Israel failed as my son as the son of God. Adam failed, Abraham failed, Isaac, Jacob, David, Saul, they all failed. Now if you are the son of God, command it, you know. So what would have happened if Jesus turned that into bread? It was a selfish thing. It would have been a selfish thing and therefore breaking the covenant and yeah. therefore failing. He would have he would have sinned <laughs> exactly exactly if you are the son of god turn this into bread so here we see jesus in israel in the wilderness all over again it's a repeat of of what israel went through so having faced the devil in the wilderness and remained faithful to the covenant israel failed to keep jesus immediately went about announcing after he succeeded he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand so now that he succeeded uh, in turning against uh, turning against uh, the devil and uh, 
fulfilling God's covenant, he could now, he now had the right to proclaim it because now he was tempted and he, by God's power, not in his own power, but by God's power, he succeeded in living that life. Matthew 4, 17 talks about, uh, where he talked about repent. In other words, Jesus is proceeding to do precisely what ancient Israel was supposed to do, which was to establish the kingdom of God. And they failed, Jesus succeeded thus far. And, and then it says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a tre special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. This is, this is the goal of God. So, and you shall be to me, listen to this, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 9, 19, 5 and 6. They failed. Jesus came. He succeeded. Now he's calling us to be a kingdom, uh, to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This was God's purpose all through the Bible. This is a, it isn't the old covenant versus the new covenant. No, not, nothing like that. The old covenant was from the beginning when man tr mankind tried to save themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, all that the Lord has said, we will do. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't be obedient, you know. It, it's impossible to be obedient. But living the life of the Son of God through his power, like Jesus did, that's, that's where it's all at. <clears throat> if Israel had been faithful to the covenant, God would have made them a great nation and they would have become the attraction of the world. You see that in Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 through 8. So what Matthew is saying in the New Testament, he wants us to understand that when Jesus comes announcing the kingdom of God, he's in the process of doing what? Redeeming us. Redeeming Israel's failure to be God's faithful son to the nation. So now Jesus is beginning all over again, <laughs> just like they all did. Now Jesus is fulfilling God's plan, this covenant plan for mankind. So in order to set up the kingdom, Jesus proceeds to do two things. Uh, do you think it has anything to do with uh, the same thing that happened in Israel? <laughs> he selects 12 apostles, first of all. Talk about that. Mirroring the 12 sons of Jacob, right? And the 12 tribes of Israel. So according to Matthew, Jesus is doing what? He's founding a new Israel. You believe that? <laughs> we are Israel. <laughs> we are the sons of God that God has called us to be. Number two, he embarks upon the mission that Israel was supposed to execute namely to break down all the ethnic barriers and incorporate the Gentiles into this covenant kingdom of God. Daniel 9, 24 to 27, we see that clearly, 490 days, uh, 490 years were given <clears throat> to Israel to turn their lives around and to continue to be the covenant, uh, to continue to be the sons of God, to continue to stay faithful to God, but they failed. They failed that this purpose. And so God sent a new messenger, as we see in Daniel 9, that Jesus is now this covenant. Jesus is now the new, uh, the new son of God brought about to live this covenant out in his life so that we in turn live out this, to live out this purpose. Did Jesus fail in any capacity? If he did, like you said, we wouldn't be here today. <clears throat> and that's, uh, you can see all this in Matthew four twenty three to 25. The covenant to Israel fulfilled, as we see in Exodus 23, 25, Deuteronomy 7, verse 15, and Matthew 12, 23, um, where it shows that Jesus has fulfilled what covenant, uh, the covenant that Israel failed to do. So Matthew's gospel points out what? That Jesus is the ultimate covenant Son of God who fulfilled, who fulfilled the purpose for our lives, to which all the other sons of God pointed. So when somebody says, oh no, he was, you know, he was the only begotten Son of God created at some point in time. No. Was, was, was Isaac 
you know, Abraham, God's, God called Isaac, uh, your first son will be, will be heir. Was he Abraham's first son? Ishmael was. So it's not talking about genealogy here. God wasn't concerned so much about the genealogy. And when Jacob was called, was he the first son? He wasn't the first literal son. So God is talking about a plan. God is talking about a relational uh, aspect of uh, our relationship with him. And that's what he's concerned about here. And that's exactly why they call Jesus the son of God. He's the son of promise typified in Abraham's miracle birth son, Isaac. He's the covenant son represented in Isaac's son, Jacob. He's the firstborn son of God foreshadowed in Jacob's sons who collectively composed God's nation son of Israel. And he is God's begotten and anointed son of which King David was a mere shadow. He is the peaceful son of God who came to establish God's eternal kingdom without war prefigured in David's son, Solomon. And Jesus is the son of God in the sense that he fulfilled the entire narrative plot line of the Old Testament by successfully living out the purpose God had for humanity all along. That's it. And he succeeded. Praise the Lord. You know, our life was in his was in the balance, you know, when Jesus cried out to the Father, uh, my God, my God, if it's be possible for this cup to pass in me, to pass over me, you know, please take this cup away, this cup of iniquity. Well, what was Jesus saying here? What, what cup of iniquity was he talking about? The wrath of God. The wrath of God. The sins of mankind. The sins of mankind. So, so it's evident that when the writers of the New Testament call Jesus the Son of God, they're not trying to tell us anything about his origins or how he came into existence way back in eternity past. Rather, they are telling us that Jesus is the Son of Promise in the Abrahamic, Davidic lineage. And according to Matthew, Jesus is the Son of David, the Son of Ava, Abraham, and as such, he is the long-awaited son of God who would be finally true to the covenant. And he did it all because he was divine, right? He relied on the son of God because he was God. He, he relied on the son of God, but what did he become? He became man and he gave up that divinity for mankind. So he didn't depend. He gave up the divinity in the, the sense that he didn't. The power that came with being divine. Divine. He gave, up. he gave up. He never used his divine powers to overcome sin. And when you see Desire of Ages 117, if I'm not mistaken, talks about that Jesus took on all the sins of the last 4,000 years uh, from the time of Adam. Adam was perfect, you know, but he failed. So Satan thought, <laughs> This is easy. Jesus came from a line of murder, from a line of incest, from a line of uh, jealousy, from a line all, all these sins. Uh, Jesus had this genealogy, and he could have lived out the sins of the forefathers. But what did he do? He depended entirely on God. You know, that's encouraging to me as a Christian because I don't have to live out the life of my father and his mother and we go way back. Our lineage goes way back, you know, if you remember. Do a study, uh, look online, the study of the Dion family and all the twins, five, six twins, they were sold into, they were, they were sold as slaves, basically, uh, way back in the 1800s. And, and they used to, and, and they, were, they were sex slaves, and you know, and, and that passed on the lineage in my family. But I had a choice, I could stop that. And I did, by God's grace. But it wasn't me, because I didn't have the power. I didn't have the strength to stop all these sins that were passed on from generation to generation in my background. But, um, but I, by the grace of God, I became a son of God. And, and through God's power living in me, I could live out his life. Live out thy life within me. Thou, how does that song go? Live out thy life within me. <laughs> I 
I'm not good at remembering words unless I have the music in front of me. So if I ever have to sing up front, you'll see me with uh, sheet music because I'm not good at remembering. I don't know how they do it on the voice. You know, they, they don't have any sheet music. And I say, I can never, especially if I'm a little bit nervous, I'll forget everything. <laughs> any thoughts? No? Good. Go to Luke. Or not go to Luke. Let's let's talk about Luke. But you can you can you can write the text down. Luke's narrative of the Son of God is also grounded in the Old Testament. Luke what? Uh, well, you can uh, look at Luke one thirty to thirty three, where it talks about Mary, the woman, would bring forth a son. And what does that remind you of in Genesis three fifteen? And the, and the woman. What? How does it go? We'll bring forth the son. You're not. No, and, and talking about to where the woman will crush her. Oh, Satan would, uh, Satan would bruise our heel, but his heel. His heel, but what? The head of the serpent would be crushed. The head of the serpent would be crushed. So the woman, Mary here, is the woman. She gave birth to a son, and he would be called son of the highest. He would be given the throne of his father David, and he would reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there would be no end. So he's called the son of the highest, right? Is his Davidic identity here, not of his ancient origin again, okay? Luke wants us to understand that Jesus is God's son in the same sense that David was within the flow of God's covenant plan. For mankind from the beginning of time. Only Jesus fulfilled the role that David and all the other sons of God failed to realize. Jesus will finally be faithful to the covenant of, of his sonship position. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be alive today. So when Gabriel communicates this message to Mary, he's announcing the long and waited, awaited Son of God. He will live and reign as God's faithful son on the throne of David. So that Holy One, Luke 1, 34 and 35 tells us, who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay, did you catch that? That Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God because he, it is his, like, like we've been talking about, uh, covenantally speaking, he is the Son of God. So he will be called the Son of God precisely because he was conceived in Mary's womb by a miracle, as was who else? Who else was conceived of a miracle? John the Baptist was. John, Isaac. Isaac. Isaac is specifically what I was thinking of. Not because he always was the Son of God but by nature before coming to our world, but because he was born and God made him. God, he was, he was called the son of God at his birth. But specifically when he was baptized. Because uh, God spoke from heaven and what did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There you go. There you go. Uh, so, 32 and 132 it says, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Yeah, like we, yes sir. Son of the highest. So, Luke 1, 54 and 55 um, shows, how, uh, shows how Jesus lived out this life of, uh, of sonship. To live out the covenant which was promised to Abraham in Luke 1, 72 and 73. And again in Luke 2, verse 7 and verses 10 through 11, Luke uses birth, the birth and sonship of Jesus in direct relation to his birth from the womb of Mary, okay? The woman, as Genesis 3.15 foretold. Luke is showing us that Jesus, as God himself, at Sabbath, what you got for me? Okay. <laughs> Luke is showing us that Jesus, as God himself, shows us by the miracle of incarnation to faithfully live out the sonship role for which all humans were made. We're all made to be this way. Adam was, he failed. Abraham was, he failed. 
It's going on through the through the lineage. They all fail, but Jesus fulfilled that purpose, and He is calling us now. As the Bible says, I pray, Father, that You would be in me as I is in them, and they in me. This is His whole purpose for mankind. After Jesus begins His public ministry, guess what He's called by Luke in Luke three twenty one and twenty two. Yes. He is called the Son of God. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So he was called the Son of God at his bapt or when he was baptized, when he began his public ministry. Okay, just before he went into the wilderness. Next, we see Jesus tempted in the wilderness. Luke four and verse two. So just as Israel Israel was tempted in the wilderness and failed, or even as Adam was tempted and failed, Genesis 3, Adam, as God's son, was given dominion over the earth. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So what happened when Adam fell? What, he was the rightful ruler over, over earth. What happened at that point when he fell? Satan usurped the throne. Adam's throne. So he, he was the king of this world. So who became the king? Satan. He transferred the legal authority over to Satan of this earth. Mm -hmm. So remember when um, in the book of Job where, uh, where um, all the uh, sons of God were called uh, before God and uh, he pointed out to Satan, where, where you come from? And what, is, what did Satan say? Going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. And what does that mean? Yeah, in the Old Testament, we're told what roaming to and fro. What was, what was that saying? Position. Where I step foot, I own. Yeah. Everywhere I step, I own. <laughs> God, God knew that He would say that. So, He owns. He owns. He is the rightful ruler of this earth. He was. In Luke four, five, and seven. Satan is offering this authority back to Jesus under the condition that he does what? Remember what he said? He was on the pinnacle of the mount overlooking Jerusalem. I was there, by the way. It, it was beautiful. Looking over and looking at that, especially, especially the uh, Muslim. Uh, you mean on the temple? Yeah, on the temple. He said, throw thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee. Mm -hmm. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone, except be left out to keep thee in all thy ways. <laughs> exactly. So, <clears throat> when Satan is offering this authority back to Jesus, he is saying, you know, if you bow down and you worship, wor me. worship me, all these I will give you. Just like he offered to Israel, just like he offered to all of them, and they all failed. And so he says, man, one desperate last attempt to get Jesus to worship him. And if Jesus bowed down and worshiped him, what would have happened? Then we would have been lost. But there, there were four times he tried. <laughs> he tried when he was a baby. Yep. He tried when he tempted him all those three to three times. Then he tried through Peter. Oh, this is, this is not it. I mean, and then Jesus rebuked him again. And then he tried at the, gar at the Gethsemane. Yep. He tried all those four times to get him to go back to heaven and give it up. Yep. So, Luke, Luke wants us to understand that in Christ we have a new Adam, a new son of God who has now arrived on the scene to reverse the effects of the fall and reclaim dominion over the earth. And it's 1040 right now. <clears throat> We got the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and we've got the Book of Romans. All, all through the New Testament, it continues, continues talking about um, Jesus being the begotten Son of God in the covenant sense. When Jesus, uh, when Jesus died on the cross and and he was resurrected, what happened at that point with uh, Satan's uh, authority? When? Yes. At what time? He didn't have he, he didn't have death no more. 
I mean, he, he lost control. You mean at the, cruci the crucifixion of Christ? Yeah. Okay. He, he uh, also was banned from heaven. No longer, no longer able to go to heaven. Why? Because Christ won. And he no longer, Satan no longer represented this earth. Yeah. So, interesting, huh? He's like Taiwan. He still has the country, but he's not in control of it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so Jesus won the victory. Any any closing, any closing thoughts? We're not going to continue on here, but. Um, well, when he was getting, when he was, when he was tempted, a lot of people could look at that and be like, well, why would he? But like, Jesus knew what he was going to have to go through. Yeah. So he had a lot to gain in giving up. Like, he didn't have to go through the suffering. He didn't have to go through the betrayal of the people that loved him. He, he didn't have to go through the torture, the hanging on the cross. Like, did, Jesus knew what he was going to face. Yeah. So it was, it's pretty powerful that in his weakest moments, he still decided to take that for us yeah. and when he could have just took the easy way out because his life wouldn't have changed God yeah, I mean, exactly. it's not like any loss for him his but life wouldn't people that don't love me I'm going <clears throat> to turn my back on them like they do to me anyway so who cares you yeah. know? and you know you're right in, in a sense that it, it wouldn't have changed who God was he could have went back to heaven he said it himself I could call 10,000 angels to deliver me mm. but on the other hand, if he would have went back to heaven without us, do you think that he would be happy? <clears throat> but his love was so great that that's why he stayed. Mm -hmm. His it, love for us was so great. I'd like to share a poem. It's called uh, Father with Son. It's the, a poem of the gospel about his name. It pretty much shares there shows his love for mankind father of son wondrous glory before time began decoration of name with nail in hand a sacrifice so worthy an act so true beyond our understanding salvation for me and you claiming what is his and word of spirit's heart glory in its being going in from the start destiny foretold his children saved in the simplicity of his name. Before the, before the foundations we were called, my children come home, one and all. Thank you, Yahweh, in Yeshua's name. You are the fire that completes the flame. <laughs> wow, you're poetic. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so what's the conclusion of the matter? <clears throat> God loves us. God, God so loved the world. You know what? I've got, so, I've got something written down here. John 3.16. We know what it says. And I'm going to say what it's actually saying. Scripturally. God so loved with covenant faithfulness the whole world, both Jesus and Gentiles, or both Jews and Gentiles, rather, that he gave to the whole world his only begotten son of promise, to demonstrate what true sonship looks like so that whenever or so that whoever believes in him as God's faithful son and is born again through him into true sonship should not perish under the covenant curses but have everlasting life under the covenant blessings amen let's pray father in heaven thank you so much for your blessings thank you for given your life for us and thank you for the covenant that you fulfilled making it possible showing that it was possible that it is possible for us to live out your life within within us within each one of us help us to depend on you more and more fully and prepare us for your soon return is our prayer in jesus name amen, amen. All right, well thank you very much